letting an insurrectionist free in Barabbas. But as Jesus says, you know, as Pilate says, what is truth? So Pilate is panicked. He questions Jesus, but Jesus gives him only one answer in this moment. Jesus has already said clearly and freely who he is. He's already lived who he is. He's the son of God most high, so he's not going to keep answering a question for Pilate, and Pilate will not actually want to hear the answer and listen to the answer. But Jesus does make clear to Pilate, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And now that Pilate is free from sin, not that Pilate is free from sin, he is sinning in this moment, is about to sin in having Jesus crucified, but Jesus is saying here that the one who has put you in this position to sin is, is great, in greater rebellion before God. And then on, Pilate keeps trying to let Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders are having none of it. And they make it clear to Pilate in verse number 12, again, they are thinking that they're on the same wavelength, that they are aware of the same thing that is running through Pilate's mind. Remember, Pilate and the Jewish leaders are very much alike in their thinking and scheming. Verse number 12, the religious say, leaders say to Pilate, if you let Jesus go, you are no friend of Caesar. For anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. So in other words, Pilate, if you don't do what we want you to do, we're going to go right behind your back, right above you. We're going to go to Caesar himself, and that's not going to bode well for your reign, your power, and your life. See, the Jewish leaders, again, and Pilate are the same. Pilate tried to get what he wanted, which was just to wash his hands of this situation by passing Jesus off to Herod. The religious leaders are going to do what they, they're going to get what they want done, even if they have to pass over Pilate and go to Caesar, right? Birds of a feather flock together and they also scheme together. They also scheme in the same way. I'm hearing this, Pilate snaps. He knows what he's got to do. He doesn't want to do it, but he's got to do it to protect his position and power. And so he takes his position of power. He sits down in his judgment seat where he decrees and declare and where decrees and declarations are made. John notes that this happens at about noon on the day of the Passover. Keep that little nugget in mind. Pilate sits down in his judgment seat and says, "Here is your king to the Jews." But the Jews shout, "Take him away! Take him away! We have no king but Caesar." And with that, Pilate hands the Son of God over to be crucified. Now, we've obviously covered a lot of ground, a lot of events and time this morning. What does this teach us, though, about Jesus? How can we actually apply these truths of Jesus to our lives? Well, we've already revealed that the big idea, made note of the big idea of this passage, and really the whole of John's historical and accurate account of the life of Jesus, is that the truth of who Jesus is can be seen in his testimony. We, you, one, all, Pilate, Judas, Nicodemus, Peter, we are all, without exception, invited to look to Jesus and see that he is truly the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. To see that there was something truly out of this world different about Jesus. That he wasn't only kind to sinners, but he was also convicting of sin. That he wasn't only good to sinners, but he also has the power to judge sinners. That he wasn't only a magician with a few tricks, but he could actually fully heal you. Right again, John's gospel begins with Jesus' forerunner, John the Baptist, saying to anyone who will listen, all those who were considered even his followers, he gives up that power and that position, and he points to Jesus and says, look, look to him, not me. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We have just spent the past now four weeks with Jesus himself, extending his hand, making available the truth of who he is to even his worst enemies. To Judas, his betrayer. To Peter, his denier. To the religious leaders, his harshest opponents. And to Pilate, his executioner. 
And as Jesus is now bound, beaten, bloodied, and headed for the cross, it would appear that he is finally lost. That his mission has been thwarted by these sins of the lost, sinful world. Yet even this, his death is under his control. Even this is the crescendo, the most brilliant testimony to the truth that Jesus truly is who he says that he is. The Son of God, the Lamb of God himself who takes away the sins of the world. Remember, I told you to store that little nugget that John leaves us with, that Jesus is sentenced to death at noon on the day of the Passover. And why on earth would John who doesn't really waste much time and energy, why would he seemingly waste space in his gospel with that detail? Because it wasn't a waste, because this was important to our faith and to Jewish history. A quick recap of Jewish history, what is the Passover in celebration of? It's a celebration of that God, way back in Egypt, did what he said he was going to do and faithfully passed over the houses, of those, the houses and lives of those who obediently spread the blood of the first Passover lamb over their door frames. And the Passover celebration was for every year and was for every generation after that, a celebration and a reminder that one day God would send his once and for all Passover lamb. But until that time, every Passover at noon, priests would have to shed the blood of countless lambs for the countless sins of God's people, of every person and every family. The purification of sins was almost an endless job that would begin at noon on the Passover and would need, again, countless lambs. That is until, John says, that is until noon on this Passover. For this Passover at noon, God's final, God's perfect, God's once and for all lamb is being slaughtered. God's Passover lamb, who would not only take away the sins of one family for one year, he's being silently slaughtered, as God always promised that he would. On this day at noon, on that first Good Friday, one gruesome reminder, that one gruesome error of reminders where countless sacrifices needed to be made for the countless sins of God's people came to an end because God himself, God's perfect lamb made the once and for all sacrifice for all of God's people's sins. Their sins of the past, their sins of the present, and their sins of the future. God's word through the prophet Isaiah predicted that this exact thing would happen. See, re- hear these words of the prophet Isaiah and hear if this does not describe Jesus. For he was described and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom the people hide their faces, he was despised and was held in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of his people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord himself makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. His righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, he will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for their transgressions. Is this not what Jesus has done? Is this not who Jesus Christ is? The invitation that John gives us, even in that little detail, to see Jesus was sentenced to death and slaughtered at noon, is to look 
to Jesus? Does he not fulfill every one of the promises of God that is to come with God's lamb? Do you see that and do you receive in faith the truth that Jesus Christ is God's perfect Passover lamb? The one and only lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Do you believe that? And that is why we are here this morning. That is why we celebrate. That he is God's perfect lamb. So how do you apply this truth? First, has this truth been applied to your life? Have you opened up your heart to see Jesus Christ as your perfect sacrificial lamb for all of your sins, no matter how great or how many they might be? There was none closer on the surface, and this is the challenge of the message. There was none closer on the surface by worldly standards to God than the religious leaders. What we see here, John makes clear in their actions, they make clear that in reality they were as far away from God as possible. Think about this this week, because we'll pick up where we left off next week right here. But these religious leaders claimed God as their king on the surface. But think about what they say. What they actually declare. What was actually on their heart through their own words in verse number 15. Verse number 15, they say, We have no king but Caesar. How disgusting, right? That people claiming to speak for God, people claiming to be righteous before God, would have hearts that are actually speaking so much for themselves that they will declare any king who says what their itching ears want to say as their king. The question of this passage is, is Jesus truly your king? Right, The cross, Easter, when looked at in the light of Christ, it will illuminate as it did negatively for Pilate, for Judas, and the religious leaders, as it does Pilate positively for Peter. It will illuminate who your true king really is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this testimony that of your word and your son made flesh. We thank you that he has lived the perfect life that we could never and would never live. So perfect, free from sin is not what we are called to, Lord, but we are called to faith in your son, Lord. And so I pray uh, for many in this room, for those that are joining us online that are already following you, have already committed their lives to you, have already come to belief that, that you are Lord and that you raised your son from the dead, Lord, and that thus have saving faith, that as we go through these lives, that you would illuminate any uh, areas in our life that we have placed another king on the throne and maybe an idol king, maybe a, a person king on the throne of our lives, Lord, and we would place you there, Lord. We would place submission and obedience to you above all else, Lord. And for those, if there's any within the sound of my voice that have yet to come the first time belief in your son, let's uh, make it be clear this morning to them and to their hearts that it is truly not through any work of their hand. It's not through anything that they could do or will do by which they are saved. But it is because that on noon on that first good Friday, your son made the once and for all. He did the work. He completed the work, the once and for all sacrifice that covers any and all sin. And so, Lord, again, we go forward in this place confessing your son as that perfect Savior. And we go forth from this place singing truly in our hearts. And not just with words, not, but with our deeds and with our heart's allegiance. We say, all hail King Jesus. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. Hallelujah. Stand and we'll sing all hail King Jesus. Mm -hmm. 